The Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington presents World Focus, a continuing series on international political, social, economic, and cultural issues. Good evening. Welcome to our second lecture in the Strom Lecture Series for 1987. I'm Professor Naomi Sokoloff of the Jewish Studies Program and the Near East Department, where I teach Hebrew language and literature. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker. He is Robert Alter, Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at the University of California at Berkeley. Those of you who are here for the first lecture on Tuesday night already know that Professor Alter has done extensive work on a rather astonishing variety of uh, subjects within the field of literary studies. Among other things, he's the author of a book on biblical narrative as well as a book um, on biblical poetry. And he's published two books of essays on modern Jewish writing. One is called After the Tradition and the other is called Defenses of the Imagination. In addition to this work within the realm of Jewish studies, he has also written books on the history of the novel, on Fielding, on Stendhal, and on the picaresque. I've been a fan of his for a long time because his writing consistently exhibits uh, several qualities which are often all too difficult to find in contemporary literary criticism. One is that he always writes very lucidly. Another is that he has a rare genius for identifying interesting problems. He can discern where the really compelling issues are he synthesizes a broad range of thought about those issues and then brings uh, an astute critical intelligence to his analysis of the issues. As you can see, I'm, I'm genuinely delighted to have him here this year as our Strom lecturer. And uh, I'm especially glad that he's speaking about modern Hebrew literature. His articles on modern Hebrew literature have been influential in opening up what's a fascinating field to the English reading public, which otherwise would not have very much access to this material. I hope you'll come away from these lectures sharing some of my own enthusiasm for and my fascination with modern Hebrew literature and with the exceptional history of the Hebrew language. Tonight's talk is called Toward a Language of Experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Robert Alter. Uh, that is, we, we left uh, Hebrew prose uh, Tuesday evening alive and well in the year 1896, and then we're going to jump ahead just about 10 years, still staying in Russia. By the turn of the 20th century, Hebrew literature in Eastern Europe was an extraordinary success story, not in scale, for it remained necessarily the movement of a tiny elite, but in quality. Its greatest center was in Odessa, where the remarkable journal Hashiloach was published, where Mendela reigned, where the young poets H.N. Bialik, Saul Chernochovsky, Yaakov Steinberg, Zalman Schneer were active, but there were also other centers and other journals in Vilna, Warsaw, Lemberg, and even small Western outposts in London and Berlin. Some of the most innovative of the new writers of fiction who began their careers around this time felt stymied by the very solidity and the formal harm harmony of the nusach that Mendel had established as the model of Hebrew prose. Aspiring to Chekhovian subtleties or Dostoevskian intensities, or embarked on a Nietzschean project of radically redefining received values, and in any case, concentrating on the isolated, disaffected intellectual instead of the Jewish community and the typical Jew, these new Hebrew writers needed a language that could accommodate nuance, dissonance, sordidness, ambiguity, wavering inwardness, as the classicizing balance and fullness of the Nusach could not. The achievement of Mendele was such an authoritative model of good literary Hebrew that certain of the new writers were impelled quite deliberately to write bad Hebrew, and I'll explain that in a few minutes, in order to make the language serve new purposes. It is only a partial exaggeration to say that their implicit aim 
was to transform Hebrew from within into a European language. This act of linguistic subversion is something that Bialik, always the faithful stylistic disciple of Mendele, clearly detected. Two decades after the second revolution in Hebrew prose, he advises the young Hebrew novelist Yochanan Tversky in 1923, this is in a letter, Gnesson and his crowd sinned in this regard to a certain extent. One doesn't draw analogies from one language to another, and certainly not from an Aryan to a Semitic language. And by the, 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 the phrase in Hebrew for uh, one doesn't draw analogies from one language to another is ein lemedin milashon lelashon, which is itself a beautiful example of what those of you who know Hebrew, what the nusach is, since it, it's a pure Talmudic idiom. Uh, that is, it's just that you don't draw analogy from one uh, kind of tort law to another kind of tort law in the Talmud. Bialik's motives, let me suggest, are both nationalistic and aesthetic. In his view, a writer ought to follow the indigenous patterns of classical Hebrew because they reflect the national genius, the accumulated historical experience of the people, and also because by adhering to them, the literary work is endowed with stylistic consistency, formal coherence. On the other side of the barricades, the writers who rejected the Nusach did so in part on ideological grounds because they were proposing a new order of national experience for the Jewish people, and in part, the larger part, I think, on artistic grounds because they placed mimetic fidelity above aesthetic completeness, that is, faithfulness to the object that you're trying to represent. An interesting case in point is Mikha Dov Bedachevsky, 1865 to 1921, a Russian-born writer who migrated to the West to get a PhD in philosophy and ended up spending most of his career in Berlin. He published his first stories in the 1890s, and they made a strong impression on younger writers like Chaim Yosef Brenner, 1881 to 1921, and Uri Nissan Gnesin, that's G-N-E-S-S-I-N, -S -S 1879 to 1913, uh, writers who began their literary careers a decade later, that is, in the 1900s. To an ear attuned to the idiomatic modulations of the classic Hebrew sources, Berdachevsky's prose can often be rather grating, though it is quite possible that he did not have as sure a feeling for the language as did some of his literary contemporaries I suspect that to a large extent, his aim was precisely to grate on traditionally formed stylistic sensibilities. Typically in his stories and novellas, the two historical strata of Hebrew, which I explained uh, about in my lecture on Tuesday, biblical and rabbinic, are promiscuously intermingled. Mendel's imposition of a rabbinic norm is rejected, per perhaps because it was felt to be somehow restrictive were more likely because it implied on the level of style a harmony of wrought artifice that ran counter to Bedachevsky's intention to represent conditions of alienation or ambivalence and eruptions of violent desire. In his use of figurative language, though Bedachevsky does not hesitate to draw on the Bible and on rabbinic language, he exhibits a receptivity new in Hebrew writing to conventional, indeed cliche, metaphors of European literature. Collocations like depths of thought, heights of imagination, and self-consciously symbolic statements like until the curtain would be raised on life's enigma. I'm not suggesting that it takes courage or artistic boldness to succumb to a cliche, only that this willingness to import cliches from the literary environment reflects the aspiration to make the language of the prophets and the sages sound in some ways like standard modern European, capital S-M-E. Especially instructive as symptoms of this undertaking are Berdachevsky's frequent errors in Hebrew idiom. Most of these cannot be shown in translation precisely because they require an, a knowledge of the original idioms, but I can offer a few small examples where the error is visible because it involves a certain redundancy. A single story, The Two Camps, written toward the end of the 1890s, is sprinkled 
with such usages as the following. When her lover was impoverished from his possessions, I'll come, you hear the redundancy, I'll come back to that. Or an, another phrase, according to the words of the people, le fille de vrai habriot, or another one, his soul then longs after intimacy and privacy, mit gagat achare. In each case, Berdachevsky's familiarity with the way of putting things in another language sets up probably an unconscious interference with the Hebrew idiomatic pattern. Uh, for example, in, uh, he was uh, impoverished from his possessions. The superfluous from his possessions appears because the writer has half in mind another Hebrew idiom for impoverishment, which is yarad uh, min literally went down from his possessions. That, that's how you say in rabbinic Hebrew and in Nusach Hebrew to be bankrupt. Uh, and on this has been imposed a European pattern in which a, a passive or reflexive verb uh, in the Hebrew here, nitaldel, is used to indicate being impoverished. Well, again, according to the words of people reflects the impingement of languages that invoke um, a phrase like what people say, was man sagt in German, whereas the rabbinic idiom is content to use either according to people, le fi habriot, or by people's words, le divre habriot, but never both together the way Berdachevsky does. Finally, the verb to long, lit gagea, requires a preposition that means for, it's really to long for in English, that is el or sometimes al in Hebrew. But it appears that the writer has too much in mind the German to long for, which is sich Such misusages contribute no more than a series of minor off notes to the general artistic effect of the story. But they're interesting as inadvertent reflections of Berdachevsky's predisposition to make Hebrew work as though it were a dialect variation of standard literary European. Elsewhere, one can see the palpable gains in expression of pursuing that aim. Here are two brief sentences from chapter three of the same story, The Two Camps, which I will render in the syntactic order exhibited by the Hebrew. This is your first uh, extract. Only charity they want from him, both his opponents and his teachers. And he gives all of them his contribution with a smiling face. To pray, he doesn't go at all the whole time he has been in his hometown. And to everyone it is clear that that's how it has to be. Classical Hebrew has a good deal more flexibility in regard to the order of subject and predicate than does modern English. So the syntactic inversion at the beginning of the first sentence doesn't seem especially obtrusive in the original. In any case, both sentences swerve sharply from the model of Mendela in the way that syntax is used to follow the movements of thought. Only charity they want. And then as an explanatory afterthought appended to the they, both his opponents and his teachers. You see how that movement goes. Once more in the next sentence, the main object of thought, that which weighs on the awareness of the character, is placed against the requirements of a more formal stylistic decorum in initial syntactic position. To pray, he doesn't go at all. My guess is that uh, here the other language Berdachevsky has in mind is not German but Yiddish, Sudavene Geitnish, which would also explain the unadorned plain spoken diction of the passage. What we have here in sum is a narrative technique only marginally feasible in the allusive, formally balanced language of the Nusach, narrated monologue. Now that, that's a term uh, that I've taken from the critic Dorit Kohn and I'm gonna be using it a number of times, so let me explain. Narrated monologue, which is the mode of presentation in which the narrator, while continuing to mediate the experience of the character and render it in the third person, mimes the diction, the word order, and the imagery the character would use in its unspoken inward speech. In other words, it, 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 it's called narrated monologue because it is a monologue but not presented in the first uh, person. It's reported by a narrator, narrated by, by the, the narrative. 
other terms for this technique that uh, some of you in literary studies know are uh, uh, still and direct libre in French or uh, er lebt uh, rede in German. Uh, it's uh, sometimes called Mabba Meshulav in Hebrew. Okay, so th this is a narrated monologue. Uh, and I think this first excerpt is a clear example uh, of that. As modest as this example may be, and one could cite more elaborate and impressive instances in Berdachevsky, it represents a turning point in Hebrew narrative prose. For language here is not a completed artifact manifesting the mastery of the authorial artificer, which is what the Nusach is, but rather a means for implicating us in the processes of thought and feeling of the character. And process, I think, is a key term which I'll, I'll, I'll be coming back to, as you'll hear. In the fiction of UN Gnesin, the representation of those processes would achieve the most formidable subtlety. But before we turn to Gnesin, I want to indicate through a different kind of example that the primacy of process in the anti-Nusach writers is observable even when what is at issue is the narrator's transactions with the characters rather than with what goes on within the characters. Here's the first paragraph of chapter 11 in Y.H. Brenner's early novel, Around the Point, a book written in 1903-1904. The paragraph is a single sentence, and a rather ugly sentence at that, certainly by the standards of the Nusach, and perhaps by any standards. It may be instructive to ponder the reasons for its ugliness. This is extract two. Uh, I promise we go on from ugly to beautiful things later on. <laughs> Yaakov Avramson, who had never in his life tasted childhood, who from the time he was little, perhaps from the age of five, was accustomed to investigating things beyond ordinary ken and to analyzing everything with a fine instrument, and when he was little, never had either various kinds of toys or little girlfriends or games or any other childlike things. This Avramson as an adult, was one of those big kids who by nature are shrewd and grown up, excessively grown up. But when they attain a certain point of height, their heart turns back and becomes a child's heart. The sentence is an elaborate instance of syntactic subordination, but it is not the controlled, finely crafted kind of subordination that is set as a norm in the prose of Mendela. Instead, the sentence proceeds to a repeated splaying out of supplementary utterances from what one hesitates to call the main assertion. That is, the main clause is, uh, and sort of keep your eyes on the, the extract as I talk, Yaakov Avramson was one of those big kids. That's the main clause. The grammatical su subject is elaborated through a parallel series of relative clauses. That is, Yaakov Avramson who had never tasted childhood, who was accustomed to investigating, who never had toys, and so forth. Then the predicate is elaborated through a relative clause that contains within it a coordinate clause, who by nature are shrewd and grown up, but when they attain, and so forth. The prime symptom of this splayed out syntax is the abundant use of the dash, a frequent topographical recourse in the novel when the constraints of conventional syntax are broken ever since the time of that ultimate novelist, the great 18th century English writer, Lawrence Stern. What impels Brenner to this formal disorderliness for which there is scarcely any precedent in classical Hebrew? In a generically typical maneuver, the narrator is trying to take the measure of his character, an activity that involves assembling an indeterminate quantity of untidy data, the first series of subordinate clauses, and referring them, these data, to a purportedly familiar framework of generalized social, moral, or psychological knowledge, the second series of subordinate clauses. That, that is when he starts saying, uh, one of those kids who, the very one of those is, is pointing toward a supposedly familiar body of uh, knowledge. We approach the character asymptotically involved in a process of discovering his nature that has no fixed end, that can always benefit from further information and further sidelong perceptions. Language moves in what Roland Barthes has memorably called a metonymic skid, the time he was little, perhaps from the age of five, various kinds of toys, little girlfriends, 
games, childlike things. On this movement of skid, the narrator imposes a secondary pattern of zigzag qualification. A big kid, shrewd and grown up, excessively grown up, but their heart becomes a child's heart at the very end. If one can entertain the hypothesis of an international language with characteristic patterns of presentation of data and analysis that could be called novelistic, I am a speaker uh, of Southern novelistic, you see, um, Brenner is thinking novelistic, say Dostoevsky, Zola, George Eliot, while writing Hebrew. Unlike the Nusak writers, who often think Mishnaic, Midrashic, liturgic, while writing novels in Hebrew. Only the solitary genius of Agnon, who began his career in Palestine in 1907 as a protege of Brenner's, would find a magic formula for writing rabbinic and novelistic in splendid convergence. This language reflects a tentative, groping, arduously exploratory relation to the objects of its representation. And I think you can feel that in the paragraph. It is precisely what makes so many novels long, often untidy, and cognitively rewarding. That is, we learn something about knowing the world through, through reading great novels. In all this, what remains in the Hebrew of the model, what remains in the Hebrew of the model of Mendela is the use of the rabbinic norms of grammar, because you don't see this in the translation, which make possible the extreme pliability of syntax, however different the sprawl of that syntax, uh, however different the sprawl of that syntax looks from its rabbinic antecedents. The sole divergence from rabbinic grammar uh, is the very last verb in this passage, becomes a child's heart. That is in Hebrew, that's vayihi lulev yiladim, which is in the biblical perfect tense. The switch to uh, a biblical, uh, um, uh, I guess, that, I'm sorry, biblical imperfect tense. The switch to a biblical tense at the very end is a common usage in this period to produce through a, f a small formal heightening an effect of closure or pausal emphasis. So that it's just a, the shift in grammar is a kind of uh, signal of level of style to, to the reader. One might render the effect in English were it not for the coyness of the archaism by translating the end of the sentence as follows. Their heart turns back and lo becomes a child's heart. But I restrain myself from translating it that way. This point becomes uh, the final, about the final verb is worth registering because it suggests that Brenner did make artfully conscious choices about language and was ready to enlist the biblical stratum of Hebrew from time to time. If his diction exhibits a prosaic grayness and his syntax a jumbled look, these were qualities of style he cultivated quite deliberately. In many ways, the most remarkable among the new Hebrew writers at the turn of the century was Uri Nisan Gnesen, who first became friends with Brenner when both were students at the yeshiva in Pochep, a provincial town about 130 miles to the south of Smolensk, a yeshiva headed by Gnesen's father. Gnesen would follow Brenner to London, where the two worked together amidst contention on a Hebrew journal, Hamaorer, then to Palestine, where he stayed only a few months. Brenner committed to the collective endeavor of Zionism, though deeply disaffected from most of those who claimed to be carrying it out, remained in Palestine and was murdered by Arabs in the riots of 1921. Gnesen, similarly disaffected and committed rather to individual experience and the life of consciousness, returned to Eastern Europe. He died of tuberculosis in 1913 at the age of 34 leaving behind a handful of early stories and four boldly original novellas on which his fame chiefly rests. These constitute the earliest instance of fully achieved modernist prose in Hebrew. And in the Hebrew tradition, they've exerted oblique but significant influence on writers as various as S.Y. Agnon, uh, Simon Halkin, S. Yizhar, and Amalia Kahana Karmon. I will offer illustrative passages from the novella To the Side, Hatsida, written in 1905. The narrative situation, one can scarcely speak of a plot, 
is quintessentially Gnesinian. The protagonist, Nahum Chagzar, and that last name means strange holiday, has returned from a sojourn in Vilna to his provincial town, where he lingers for a period of many months, drifting into a circle of young women, erotically drawn to one or another of them, but not bold enough to act on his desire, just as he repeatedly projects a major critical essay he will publish while he manages to write nothing. Neurasthenic sensibility, hobbled will, frustrated imagination, the subversion of reality by fantasy, the blurring of distinctions between the experiencing self and the objective world, these are the subjects, subjects familiar to us from modernists like Proust, Bailey, Musil, Faulkner, Virginia Woolf, for the treatment of which Gnesson had to make Hebrew prose work in a wholly new way. The innovative nature of his undertaking is perhaps most evident in his handling of time. To the side, like his other novellas, abounds in indications of temporal transitions, beginnings and ends of seasons, subjective flashbacks and flash forwards. Time is not a fixed framework for the action as in earlier Hebrew fiction, but it wants something to be experienced and elusive to the grasp of experience, constantly slipping away in a movement of restless change as consciousness seeks to apprehend it. Here's a characteristic passage which begins with a narratorial report of seasonal transition, then moves into an elaborate, emotionally fraught flash forward. And uh, so that you don't get too nervous, I want to warn you, this is a sizable passage, and I'm going to be looking at it in great detail. Um, the other uh, uh, excerpts that you have in your handout we'll, we'll treat uh, more briefly. That summer was inscribed deep in the hearts of the whole group and gave them enough to fill the many long days to come. And when afterward, long gossamer threads began creeping through the air and yellow leaves falling and scattering through the park walks, Chagzar would trample the fallen leaves with wild exultation and bursting energy. And he would stand straighter, his chest widening and thrust out and his face alert. Another week, another two weeks, and the sky would turn somber, and the winds would be howling, and the days would be gloomy, and the window panes would be shaking, and the tin roofs would be rattling, hurrah! And the mood would be buoyant, and the mind would be free, and the heart would well up and overflow, and work would be cherished, and would fill the soul and enlarge the imagination. Another week, another two weeks, and the nights would be dark, and the flames of the solitary street lamps trembling, and the rains pelting down, and the swamp deep, and in the handsome, cherished room, it would be warm and light and pleasant, and the divan covered with red velvet would be soft and spacious, and the faces of the fine young women would be lovely, and their lively eyes would be filled with brightness and pleasure, and Rose's pleasing patter would flow on seductively, and Manya's careful, mischievous arguments would interrupt him abruptly, break off in the middle, and once more burst forth. And little pale Ida, Ida whose glance was so marvelous, whose braid was so soft and lovely, this Ida would not by any means agree to sit in his lap and lay her sweet head on his chest until he would catch her by her warm, soft forearm. And he would surely know that it was no little girl he had caught, and he would sit her down by force. Then she would yield and grow calm as a quiet lamb and her dear hair would be so smooth and so rich and in his power obeying his every touch. Well, there is a male fantasy if you, you ever uh, ask for it. Uh, well, I'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Now, uh, again, keep, keep your eye uh, on the, the um, uh, printed page. What I call a narratorial report of seasonal transition is actually restricted to the introductory adverbial clause of the second sentence, when afterward long gossamer threads began creeping through the air. The true beginning of the passage is an indication of the impression that the season makes on the minds and in the memories of the human witnesses. That midsummer was inscribed 
deep in the hearts of the whole group and gave them enough to fill the many long days to come. It is as though the external world had no validity or interest in and of itself, but was worthy of attention only as the occasion for subjective experience, as a provisioner of feeling and memory. And, and you can see how there's a certain uh, affinity with, with um, uh, Virginia Woolf, for example, who, who began writing uh, just a few years a after Gnesson. In this subjectivized vision of existence, very little happens at a particular point in time. Instead, there is a constant recycling in consciousness of emotion and reflection, purely inner events repeating themselves in a blur that gradually moves forward toward changes or reversals of mood. This dynamic of repetition and change explains Gnesson's fascination with moments of transition. The verb began, hitchilu, followed by a participial forms, here began creeping, falling, scattering, and so forth, predominates throughout the story, sometimes recurring half a dozen times or more in a single brief passage. In consonance with this reorientation toward time, the simple past tense, Hebrew pa'al, is largely replaced by the past continuous or iterative tense, Hebrew haya po'el, as in our second sentence, chagzar would trample, and then you have a, a series of would uh, verbs. This tense, as we had occasion to observe earlier, is an invention of rabbinic Hebrew, abundantly used in both legal and narrative texts. But Gnesson is the first, as far as I know, to make it the central vehicle of novelistic narration. And it is a change as momentous as that effected by Flaubert when he substituted the French imparfait, equally a tense for repeated or habitual actions for the historical past, the French passé simple, that was customary in, uh, until then in literary narratives. Indeed, much of what Erich Auerbach observed in my Mises on the implications of Flaubert's shift to the imperfect tense is directly applicable to Gnesson's uh, adoption of what would be the, roughly the Hebrew equivalent to that. That is, uh, Auerbach says the following about uh, Madame Bovary. The novel is the representation of an entire human existence which has no issue. Nothing particular, that is no way out. Nothing particular happens in the scene. Nothing particular has happened just before it. It is a random moment from the regularly recurring hours. And this uh, narration of the random moment, again, I, I think is one of Gnesson's important innovations in Hebrew. A particularly revealing expression of the subtle refashioning of the language in order to render a new sense of reality is Gnesson's quiet installation of what is virtually a new Hebrew tense to complement his use of the iterative. The temporal indicator at the beginning of the third sentence, another week, another two weeks, also marks a transition from the narrator's point of view to narrated monologue. Now, you all know what narrated monologue is. Not, not by the way, as many critics have carelessly said, stream of consciousness. I think that there is no real stream of consciousness in Gnesson. Th that is to say, the inward speech of the character reported from the grammatical perspective of the narrator. As is often the case, there are no unambiguous linguistic indications that we have moved into, narr into narrated monologue. The main clues being the substance of the statements, which allows us, as we read on, to attribute them with growing certainty to uh, Chagzar rather than to the narrator. That is, after the reference to darkening skies and howling autumnal winds, which momentarily seems continuous with the narrator's report of seasonal atmosphere in the previous sentence, we encounter terms like mind, mood, and heart, you know, getting to the inside the character. And from what we already know of this protagonist, the evocation of overflowing energy and productive work is surely his wishful fantasy. Then there's a second temporal indicator after three suspension points which are introduced by the author. Another week, another two weeks, that takes us into a whole fantasy scene of warm shelter and erotic arousal projected forward in time from the moment of early autumn when Chagzar stands among the leaves 
to a night of late autumn when storms rage outside. But just as nothing happens definitely at a single point in the past, nothing happens definitely at a single point in the future. And so Gnesson casts Chagzar's imaginings in a future iterative tense, the Hebrew kiye po'el, a form only occasionally attested in rabbinic and medieval Hebrew, which uses the future instead of the past tense of the verb to be as an auxiliary before the participial form of the verb. And here, l let me um, re give you examples uh, of this future iterative. The winds would be howling. That is not would howl at a, a specific point in time, but would be howling over a, an indefinite period of time. The winds would be howling, the window panes would be shaking, the tin roofs would be rattling, the flames of the solitary street lamps would be trembling, the rains pelting down. Literary readers will hardly be surprised at this strong link between the humble mechanics of grammar and overarching views of reality. Gnesson, by shifting the conventional balance of Hebrew tense usage and placing a central burden on what was traditionally a marginal tense, creates a new fluid sense of time, approximately of time as Bergsonian flux, not susceptible to mathematical definition or objective description, but rather an ambiguous kinetic entity knowable through the intuition of consciousness. Now, uh, but I'm not sure whether um, uh, this is just a coincidence or whether Gnesson actually read Bergson, but Bergson's first influential study of uh, time appeared in 1889, so there certainly was a possibility that Gnesson could have read him. The experience of flux is reinforced by the additive syntax Gnesson character characteristically uses, especially visible here in the long last sentence. The effect is quite different from the parataxis, remember that structure of and, and, and that I talked about on Tuesday, of classical Hebrew. Instead of a firmly fixed frame of relatively short parallel utterances as in biblical prose, the sentence unravels like a big ball of yarn, one and clause following another, and the nights and the flames and the rains and in the room and the divan and the faces and so forth. What dictates this structure is the associative movement of the character's imagination from one object or image to the next contiguous one. There is no fixed order, no hierarchy, no definite end in the series or in the mental process that engenders the series. Indeed, a common denominator of much modernist writing is the rejection of traditional hierarchies. And Gnesson's prose with its run-on sentences and its additive syntax is a beautiful enactment of such a rejection of hierarchy. Our passage exhibits other means for dramatizing the perspective of the character. The most notable of these is the repetition of emotionally freighted terms. This is a kind of repetition that works in a way opposite to anaphora or rhetorical repetition, which one often encounters in Nusach prose. That is, anaphora is the kind of repetition, like if you're making a speech and you say, uh, the time has come to shake off our chains, the time has come to march to the future, the time has come to declare our freedom, and so forth. Th th this is an anaphora, you know, it's very rhetorical and that you find in Nusach writing. But here we have a different sort of repetition. Anaphora conveys a sense of controlling authorial presence, insisting on a particular word in order to produce a calculated effect on the reader. In Chagzar's narrated monologue, on the other hand, the reader is no more than an eavesdropper, and the repetitions, which have none of the formal symmetry of anaphora, are expressions of the character's affective life. Thus, in the last two sentences, the room at the outset is lovely, yafe, cherished, chaviv, and warm, chamim. And the first object discriminated within the room is the soft, rach, divan. Then the young women's faces are lovely. Ida's braid is lovely. Her forearms soft and warm. Her head sweet, chaviv. Her, dear, her hair dear, chaviv. And toward the end, this pattern of affective repetition is intensified by a cluster of emotive adverbial 
so's linked to the key adjective, so marvelous, so soft and lovely, so smooth and so rich. The character in this way reveals or perhaps exposes himself through the language he uses in his thoughts. And the very terms of the repetition may raise questions about the credibility of Chagzar's imagined future of sexual conquest. The cozy room full of women on a cold, dark night is an alluring fantasy that mingles themes of shelter and gratification, which seem ultimately associated with womb-like gratification, protection or infantile pleasure, the warmth, the softness, the sweetness of it all, rather than with adult sexuality. Be that as it may, Gnesson's prose is altogether impressive in its ability to represent reflection and fantasy with a kind of sensuous immediacy. His Hebrew, moreover, has a tonal unity that avoids the grating qualities of the prose of Berdachevsky and Brenner. The general effect is very different from Nusach writing, but I would propose that the achievement of the Nusach is a precondition for Gnesson's innovations. Mendel and his disciples taught subsequent Hebrew writers how to exploit the grammatical precision and the syntactic supp suppleness of rabbinic Hebrew for the purposes of novelistic narration. Gnesson, fashioning a new experiential realism in Hebrew prose, repeatedly uses these rabbinic forms even as he pushes them into shapes that would have deeply puzzled the makers of the Mishnah and the Midrash. With this langu language, he's able to mime mental processes with the vivacity of a vernacular, even though at the time he was writing and for the real life counterparts of the figures about whom he was writing, there was no Hebrew vernacular. Gnesson's representation of the inwardness of his characters is by no means limited to this technique of narrated monologue. Let me propose for consideration a second passage in which the narrative approach to consciousness proceeds along rather different technical lines. Some attention to its details should extend our sense of how he endows Hebrew prose with a new suppleness and gives it mimetic fidelity as a vehicle for fiction. In a novella where nothing really happens, Chagzar's story is a chain of incompletions, the account of a man surrounded by fragments and tail ends of objects and projects and ideas, with even the letters of the words he tries to, to write dis disintegrating before his eyes into broken squiggles and scratch marks. And it's a kind of phantasmagoric effect. Toward the end, Chagzar's old friend and sexual competitor, Carmel, appears on the scene, exhibiting a sense of adequacy that discomfits the ever inadequate Chagzar. The last fragment, fragmentary scene of the novella takes place in Ida's room. Ida, prostrate, has been thrown into what looks like a nervous convulsion. At the turn of the century, females were supposed to be subject to nervous convulsions. Uh, into what looks like a nervous convulsion by an encounter with Carmel, and Chagzar stands beside her bedside with a glass of water in his hand. This is the last paragraph of the story, and uh, this is excerpt four. And Chagzar suddenly felt a terrible contraction of the heart, and a hot stream of blood flooded his face and made his eyes wince. What was he doing here? A moment passed, and Carmel's confident laughter cut through his heart, and his eyes saw Hannah's folded arms, and his ears heard the strong laughter of the man who had put them that way. Afterward, the advertisement of the doctor from Vilna glimmered in his mind and vanished again. And suddenly, splendid Vilna stood before him as though it were actually present. And he remembered its many Talmudic academies and the Strachan Library, and his work in the reading room, and the book Knesset Yisrael with a handsome picture of Peretz Smolenskin, and the nights of tremendous work in his quiet room there, and his friends dreaming the same dreams as he, and the contraction of his heart swelled to the point of choking. And then, with confused consciousness, he set the glass of water down on the chair, and his legs stumbled toward the door. 
And when he went outside and a fresh breeze flowed into him, his eyes brightened a bit and his temples were throbbing and his heart was pounding. And he passed the end of the street and went on outside the town and walked along lazily. And his eyes were looking with sad indifference at the long, long railroad tracks that stretched out before him, desolate and fainting from the heat of the day. Narrated monologue in this passage is restricted to a single terse sentence. What was he doing here? See, that's all you have to do is shift that into first person singular. What am I doing here uh, and present? And you get quoted monologue. Uh, uh, but uh, in the past tense, third person, it's monologue which is narrated. The rest of the passage, apart from the minimal notations of Chagzar's physical movements, is made up of what Dorit Cohn calls psycho-narration, that is, the report summary description of the movements of thought and feeling in the language of the narrator instead of their immediate rendering in the unspoken inner speech of the character. The 19th century Russian novel makes rich and abundant use of this technique. My guess is that the most pertinent model for Gnesin was Dostoevsky, who was so repeatedly fascinated with the spasmodic intensities of consciousness, with the distortive effects of obsession on the objects of perception. Here is Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, standing on the Voznesensky Bridge. I, I'm, uh, let me quote a few lines. Leaning over the water, he looked mechanically at the last pink reflections of the sunset, at the row of buildings growing dark in the thickening dusk, at one distant window high up in some roof along the left bank that shone for an instant with flame as the last ray of the dying sun caught it at the darkening water of the canal. Into the water he peered attentively until at last red circles began to revolve before his eyes. The houses spun round, the passers-by, the carriages, the embankments all reeled and swung dizzily. That it used the more you look, by the way, at 19th century novels, the more you see that, that sort of avant-garde techniques uh, in the cinema of, with handheld cameras and so forth were, were really antedated by, by techniques of the 19th century realists. There are differences in proportion between Dostoevsky and Gnesin that are approximately attributable to the differences between 19th century realist and early modernist. Dostoevsky's novel, for all its concern with psychology, accords primacy to a set of objective narrative data, an act of murder, the circumstantial concreteness of the Petersburg setting, a process of discovery, confession, punishment, and redemption in which significant events in linear concatenation definitely happen. The dizzying quality of consciousness in this brief excerpt, as elsewhere in the novel, is realistically motivated because the character in question, as you all know from reading Crime and Punishment, is in a feverish, hallucinatory state. In Gnesin the Modernist, mental processes rather than actions performed in the external world have become the real subject of narration, which is now cyclical and repetitive rather than linear in structure. And it is consciousness as such rather than consciousness in liminal states that breaks things into kaleidoscopic fragments. But nevertheless, I think you can see a kind of um, anticipation uh, 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 of this kinesthetic, kaleidoscopic, subjective uh, vision of reality uh, in Dostoevsky. Elsewhere into the side, there are subjective views of landscapes that are still closer in technique to Raskolnikov's disturbed perception here of the buildings and the canal. But what I think Gnesin may have above all discovered in Dostoevsky is that fiction could find a language to describe compellingly the spasms and associative jumps of consciousness itself. The last paragraph of To the Side begins with a heart contraction, and it is framed by the organs of perception and defined by a series of uneven pulsations. When Chagzar is confronted with the evidence of Carmel's power over Ida, heart contracts, face is flooded, eyes wince. Then in a recollection of a scene earlier that day, the heart is cut through, eyes see, and hear, uh, ears hear 
remembered sights and sounds. At the end of the passage, the eyes are again prominent, along with further attention to what might be called the cardiovascular manifestations of emotion, throbbing temples and pounding heart. The paragraph thus has both fluidity and a certain symmetry, simultaneously satisfying the demands of mimesis and aesthetic shaping in good modernist fashion. The fluidity is manifested chiefly in the associative movements of memory. Bits of recollection glimmer and vanish, like the newspaper advertisement of the Vilna doctor that Chagzar noticed earlier in the day at Hannah's house. The connection with Vilna carries him back to a more distant memory of the time he spent in that city. This memory itself is not an integrated picture, but a chain of associatively linked fragments, from academies to library to reading room to a photograph in a literary miscellany of the Haskala writer Peretz Smolenskin, and from there to the protagonist's own dreams of literary achievement. When we return through a second terrible contraction of the heart to the external world, Chagzar's body, like his mind, is swept along by forces not under volitional control. His legs stumble or wander, ta'u, toward the door in a reflexive action of escape that will, of course, amount to nothing. His eyes brighten in the open air, but only a bit and only momentarily, then in the downsweep of inner oscillation, they look with sad indifference at the receding perspective of railroad tracks. These should logically point to a way out of the emotional prison of the town and Chagzar's round of unending frustrations there, implying a rapid conveyance to Vilna and the great world beyond. But in fact, like everything the protagonist sees, they are only an extension, an external symbol seized upon ad hoc of his own inner plight. No train travels on these tracks that trail off to the end of vision and appropriately personified as a reflection of the character's predicament, they lie desolate and fainting from the heat of the day. The distinctive traits of Gnesson's diction, which of course will not be visible in translation, deserve some brief comment because they suggest the degree of his success in the creation at this early moment of a living literary Hebrew. To the eyes of, 20th, uh, of readers of Hebrew literature in the waning years of the 20th century, there is surely something historically prescient about this prose. Apart from a few minor exceptions, which I'll explain momentarily, the style seems not at all archaic. Indeed, sits quite comfortably on the same bookshelf with contemporary Israeli novelists, native speakers of the language like A.B. Yehoshua, Yitzchak Ben Ner, Samach Yishar, Amalia Kahana Kamon. There's only one loan word in the passage, which is long since passed out of usage, biblioteca for library, which has di been displaced by the indition indigenous Sifriya coined from Sefer book. The word for railroad tracks, misila, is a biblical term for road that was adopted for this sense in the 19th century, but has been displaced by pasim from the word for stripes, bars, or tracks. The verb I have rendered as made flinch, salad, is not to my knowledge used in this sense by any other writer. And similarly, the verb which in context appears to mean folding arms, naots, is an idiosyncratic usage for the usual sense in both rabbinic and modern Hebrew is to thrust, stab, or fix. I take the trouble to mention these small examples because we should keep in mind that until a solid community of Hebrew speakers had crystallized with a Hebrew press, schools, and official bureaucracies, writers were faced with a mechanical problem of uncertainty about the agreed meaning of some of the words they use, either because the classical sources from which they were drawn left a margin of ambiguity about their semantic range, or because they were, they were competing or eccentric views as to precisely what modern acceptation should be assigned to a particular classical word. 
If a writer like Gnesson often simulates the confused and fragmentary nature of unfocused thought, he also, like Conrad, frequently uses painstakingly elaborated figurative language to evoke states of consciousness for which consciousness itself has no words. Here is a brief observation of the narrator on Khagzar's chronic condition of quiet desperation, I quote. And the heart felt as though some thin crust were peeling off within it. And that thin crust were peeling and splitting and separating into bubbles, little bubbles. And these were sliding, sliding out and pressing against the chest and bursting into the throat. What Gnesson needed in sum for the success of his innovative enterprise was not a vernacular, but vernacular-like elements that he could incorporate in the wrought textures of a more literary language. Such elements were abundantly available to him in the heritage of rabbinic Hebrew. And the model of Mendela, for all his divergence from it, had shown him how that heritage could be exploited. Mendela had managed to make the language of the sages the medium of vividly satiric storytelling, pungent with the concrete details of quotidian reality. Gnesson, reshaping that language to follow the contours of a European syntax and European modes of conceptualization, converted it into the most persuasive expression of inner experience. Nearly two decades before kindergarten children prattled in Hebrew, before politicians made speeches in Hebrew, before vendors hawked their wares in a raucous Hebrew vernacular, Gnesson's literary transformation of the classical language made it a lifelike vehicle for the ebb and flow of consciousness of his hypersensitive, self-subverting, Russian-speaking intellectuals. Thank you.